Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I greet the uh, um, distinguished representation of the alleged victims and the delegation of the illustrious state of uh, um, Ecuador. I declare the public hearing of this case, 13.955, Gabriel Alejandro Vasco Toy Panta and others regarding Ecuador open. My name is Margaret May McCauley, President of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, and with me on, on this, at this, the hearing of this case are Commissioner Strado Rallon, Rapporteur for Ecuador. Commissioner, um, no, I don't see her. Um, as Esmeralda, I don't see her. Um, no. She's here, but without camera. Ah, I see. Commissioner, um, Esmeralda Aurecemina de Troitino, first vice president. Um, the second vice president is unavoidably absent. Commissioner Joel Hernandez, Commissioner Julissa Mantilla, and Commissioner Carlos Bernal Polito. Also present are the Deputy Executive Secretary for petition, the Petition and Case System, Jorge Mesa and the Special Rapporteur on Economic, Social, Cultural and Environmental Rights, Soledad Garcia Monos. I now give the floor to the Deputy Executive Secretary um, for petition, the Petition and Case System, Jorge Mesa to make a statement in relation to the instant case. Thank you, Executive Secretary. Muchas gracias, Señora Presidenta. El presente caso Thank you, Madam President. The instant case is about the alleged responsibility of the state of Ecuador for the lack of access of Gabriel Dasco and other boys and girls to an adequate and timely treatment. On April the 24th of 2020, the Commission approved admissibility report number 75-20 and admitted the case in relation to articles 4, 5, uh, 8, 24, 26, and 28 of the American Commission of Human Rights uh, in relation to Article 1.1 of the American Convention. All um, here we we'll listen to listen to the experts and to hear the allegations on the merits for the parties. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Um, first, the Commission will hear the testimony of witness Santiago Nuo Vasco. Morales, um, who's offered by the petitioners. The witness will testify about one, the general situation of patients with Laron syndrome in Ecuador. Two, national legal proceedings in this regard. And three, the alleged harm caused to the alleged victims due to the lack of timely access to medicines. The petitioners will have up to 10 minutes to carry out their interrogation. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, the state may interrogate the expert for up to 10 minutes. Finally, the commission will go on to ask some questions. Um, the witness, um, please, I am addressing you now. Declarant, please indicate your full name, place of birth, and place of residence. Buenos días. Yo soy... Good morning. My name is Santiago Noé Vasco Morales. Uh, I am a pediatrician. I was born in Quito, Ecuador. My IT number is 1713037602. Thank you. And um, I am here to represent one of the patients. Um, Declarant, is uh, this the expert? Testigo, señora presidenta. His represent is a. He's is a witness, a, Madam President. A witness, so he's not is not the expert. No. Okay. No. Um, Declarant, do you uh, swear? 
our promise to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Mr. Santiago? Yes, I swear. Thank you. I give the floor to the petitioners for their interrog interrogation, 10 minutes. So please start. Good morning, buenos días, señores y señoras comisionados. Good morning, commissioners. Santiago, could you help us by telling us what is your relationship? I am the father of a patient with Laron syndrome, and I am also representative of some of the patients with Laron syndrome. What Laron syndrome is? Laron syndrome is a rare disease in the world. There are only 300 confirmed cases, out of which most of them are located here in Ecuador. This disease um, provokes uh, a delay in growth and therefore normal activities such as walking, um, going up stairs, using objects, using the public transport, driving a vehicle or receiving uh, attention at customer service checkpoints is a problem because all these activities are designed for normal stature people. Also, these diseases also causes um, modifications in the perception of these patients. 10 years ago, we were starting this legal fight and there was a 17 year old guy who was crying because he was uncertain about his future, because he was not normal, because he couldn't work like others. Santiago, sorry. I think that we have a problem with your audio. We are not hearing you. Uh, maybe I can speak loudly or more loudly. We can hear him. Gabriela, we can hear him. I was listening to him. You can continue, Santiago. So this young guy, this young boy told me, nobody want me because I'm not normal. And those words were stuck in my head forever. What is the current health condition of your son, Gabriel? When a patient with Laron syndrome is young, uh, there is uh, cases of hypoglycemia. And Laron syndrome has a high rate of prevalence in this country. Um, but this is a rare disease, so uh, the diagnosis did not occur very quickly. He was like, diagnosed with other diseases, but Mr. Gavara, an expert in Laron syndrome, was able to diagnose him with Laron syndrome. So we have the final, the definite syndrome, and we knew that there was a drug that could help our son. Thank you, Santiago. What is the treatment for Laron syndrome? The treatment for patients with Laron syndrome is a recombinant drug where the only brand available is Increlex. It was approved by the FDA for human use in 2005 and in 2010 by the Drug Association of Europe. This drug helps people to grow so that they have a stature so they can perform their daily activities. So this drug would prevent the disability that these patients have. So this is not an experimental drug, it's not a dangerous drug, it is a delicate use drug. It can be used only by experts. What is the cost of this drug? For a 40 kilogram patient, the monthly cost is $2,000. But the fundamental um, problem is that this was a very rare drug that could not be bought at any pharmacy. What is the difference between receiving the drug as of two years old or receiving it 
when uh, the person is a teenager. The earlier, the better. The results are better. The case of my son, Gabriel, he started to receive the drug at 18 years old, but he measured 1.23 meters, and that would be his definite stature. But thanks to the fact that his growth cartilage uh, were still uh, growing, he was able to grow, to grow. The effect of the drug was adequate, but he lost 18 years of growth. What um, the parents of the patients had to do to receive the drug. Since 2007, we have started to go to all state agencies, public health ministry, human rights ministry, we visited all state agencies. And finally, we decided to request a constitutional remedy in 2010. And since our request for our sons to, and our daughters to receive this treatment, the constitutional court um, um, was the case. And then we went to international courts. When did the state start to provide the drug? Only after the IACHR presented its admissibility report, the state started to take effective actions to get the drug. And only after I made a direct complaint that my son was left behind, he was invited to do the test to start receiving the treatment. At the beginning, my son was excluded. There was a protocol that was aimed at patients from two to 12 years old, and my son was older, so he was excluded from the initial treatment. When did your son receive the medication? As of November, 2020. How has been uh, the supply of the drug since 2020. Um, the supply was regular, but during a period last year, the drug was not available. And from a pediatric point of view, the fact that a patient cannot grow for four months is a red flag, it's a serious issue. So there was a period during which the supply of the drug was interrupted. What would you like to tell the state? Unfortunately, the officials in charge of providing the treatment for children with Laron syndrome had authoritarian attitudes. They always place bureaucratic barriers to avoid their responsibility. And this long delayed forced many patients to become adults without receiving the necessary treatment. Therefore, consequences in these patients are irreversible and irreparable. Have the patients been repaired somehow? Or has anybody been sanctioned because of negligence? No. Thank you, Santiago. Now we would like to give you the floor back, Madam President. Thank you very much. I I now give the floor to the state of uh, Ecuador for uh, to interrogate the witness if they so desire. And you have 10 minutes for this, um, de um, the delegation of the state. Thank you. Please commence. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to confirm you can hear me. Good morning, Madam President. Good morning, Commissioners and the team. Um, good morning to the representatives of the alleged victims. The state will ask some questions. Mr. Vasco, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. According to what is established in your statement, 
You will talk about the general situation of patients with Laron syndrome. That is the first item that has been approved for this hearing. Would you mind clarifying if you are aware of the situation of all patients with Laron syndrome in Ecuador? Or do you know the situation of all those patients that you represent? Because you told us that you are the representative of some of those patients. Can you tell us, please? I represent all patients uh, who initiated originally the complaint to receive the drug. I have them identified very clearly. Out of all the persons that you actually know, how many people have received the treatment uh, supplied by the Ministry of Public Health? That is a case-by-case -case situation because there has not been a, a multidisciplinary treatment. We received individual visits with a lot of rotation and many people have no knowledge or expertise on Laron's syndrome. We had to explain them what the disease was about. So, they started to complete a checklist and they, those were the home visits that they conducted. If we ask the other patients, they will answer the same. Mr. Vasco, would you give us some figures? Do you have that number? No. According to our data, we will share this data with the commission uh, they, those data show that there is multidisciplinary attention for all the patients that are included in the petition. Let's talk about the specific situation of your son. I would like to know if your son is receiving this multidisciplinary service by the Ministry of Public Health. Since November 2020, he has received this treatment. What type of treatment has he received according to this multidisciplinary perspective? since November 20. Interpreters? Con todo gusto. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we no. can repeat. Mad Madam President, I had asked as regards uh, the specific case of the multidisciplinary uh, treatment that his son is receiving. So we were contrasting the information that we have, uh, the official information. We have uh, traumatology, psychology, neurology, physiotherapy, uh, and my family medicine, among other things. This is the conversation that we were having, Madam President. Can we resume? Yes. Yes, thank you. Now I can hear the interpreter. Thanks. Gracias, President. Thank you, Madam yes. President. Is your son, your son is receiving uh, the drugs at the moment, right? Yes. Yes, ever since November 2020, the petition was done officially in 2007 and legally since 2020, correct. You also said this, but this is very important for the commission. This is a crucial data. What is the height or what was the height of your son when he initiated the, the treatment? 123, one meter, 23 centimeters. And, and his current height, 141. Perfect. Do you know uh, well, the main uh, investigator, Dr. Uh, Guevara, the main researcher of the Laron system, in an interview that was documented in the Inter-American Report, he said that with the application of the drug, a patient with such a syndrome can grow at up to 80% of the average height of your country. Do you confirm that point of data, Mr. Vasco? I'm not an expert. I'm here as a father, but yes. It has to be taken into account that uh, yeah, this uh, was suspended for 18 years. Let's go to another question. I'm sure you know the answer. Do you know that the mean uh, height 
for an Ecuadorian is from 1.64 to 1.67. That is that your son has reached the, the height of growth that Dr. Guevara referred to, that you have confirmed. Is that the case? Yes, but we have to take into account the 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 height of the father and the height of the mother. The mother uh, is 167 and I am 169 and the my oldest son is 172. So we don't have to work on the population standards, but actually to take into account the measurements of the father and the mother so that in basis of on the basis of that to do to conduct the diagnosis. This is what any pediatrician with basic knowledge uh, can attest to. Yes, your comment is important, but I was referring to the study that you, you said that you are aware of and, and you have um, agreed with that definition. Do you have scientific uh, certainty that you your son would have been taller if the drug would have been administered at the moment? Definitely, yes. The study of the mescal medicine uh, started in 1992 to with Dr. Jaime Guevara, yes, and that obtained very good results. And then that was the pioneer study where they started researching this drug for the Laurent syndrome. Yes, but we have evidence we'll be submitting this and you surely have those documents at hand where it reads that there's a different point of view with respect to the question I posed, but there is scientific certainty, which is very complex. And definitely, the studies are being uh, developed because, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, they are overlapping. So you have said that there are reports that counter Applications that the pharmaceutical companies are are asking for, Madam President, the, they are uh, speaking of conclusions. So, sorry, thank you, Madam President. I only have one further question. Do you know the relationship between the pharmaceutical company of uh, um, producing Incralex and Dr. Guevara? No, Mr. Expert. Thank you, Mr. Vasco, for your answers. And thank you, Madam President. I give you back the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you to uh, the state for their questions. Um, <clears throat> I now give the floor to the commissioners um, to ask questions of the witness. And uh, the commission will have 15 minutes and the, uh, in this order. Um, Commissioner Strat <coughs> Estrado Rallon, who's the rapporteur for Ecuador, um, will start comments um, the questions. Estrado. Thank you very much, Madam President. I think that the question I have has to do with Uh, were to, to receive more detail with the fact on on the administration of the drug, a delayed administration, and why was this delayed? And the other question is, what measures do you think that the state should adopt to repair the damages caused? That those would be my questions, Madam President. Thank you. So, what do you think about the delay? I did not understand your question. Please uh, ask them again. I'm sorry, I did not ask, uh, understand the questions. Let me rephrase them. Basically, how do you think the state should act to repair the damages that you have suffered? That would be my question. Well, it's very hard to say because, as we said before, you cannot give back what we lost. The case of my son, particularly, he lost uh, five, 18 years of growth. Uh, he has grown uh, some uh, this year. So just imagine how much he would have grown if he had received the, the drug. And what's most serious is the patients that requested the drug and then reached 
uh, over 18 years of age without receiving the drug and the treatment that they needed. So I don't, I have no idea. I am first a human being, then a, a doctor. So I wouldn't know what legal steps should be taken. The only thing I know is that growing for a child is fundamental and that these group of patients were denied growth. That's the only thing I know. Thank you very much. I don't have any further questions for the moment, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Alon. I now invite the first Vice President um, Esmeralda Osimina de Troitino to put her questions. Are you still on? I understand your camera wasn't working. Yeah, muchas gracias, Presidenta. Esmeralda? Yes, I'm here. Madam President, can you hear me? Can you well, hear me all? I hear the interpreter, thank you. A ver, a ver. No me escucha. Please proceed. Me escuchan ahora? Can you hear me now? Sí. Yes. Madam President, I think that Commissioner Vice President has her mic on, but maybe so that you we can hear you, Madam Vice President, you should activate your mic. The technical team, could you support us? She seems to have her mic off. Adelante, Vice Presidenta, le escucho. Go ahead, Madam Vice President, we can hear you. Okay. So I think the witness who is submitting his statement today uh, in, in direct relationship with the case. So my question would be, what's your assessment of the need and the importance today of having the state providing a timely response for all children and adolescents that are affected by this syndrome. Well, from this from the starting point, we were requesting this for all patients. And while I don't have all the data for all patients and the state does, we always worked so that all children and adolescents received the drug that they needed. This disease had an advantage, which was that if they received the drug in a timely manner, their disability could uh, go away and they could uh, grow to an almost uh, um, natural height. So the request is to have uh, the state administer the drugs that the patients need. Okay, then another question, specific question with regard to the institutional responses as regards the protection of childhood. Did you receive any specific support by these institutions that are in charge of protecting children and adolescents? We could say that, yes, we received support because the second um, court of criminal guarantees of Pichincha uh, said that we were right. The institutional court said that we were right. The ombudsperson's office also said that we were right. So the Ministry of Health is the one that did not comply with its obligations. Okay, thank you very much. Those are my questions at this moment, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you, Madam First Vice President. I now invite Commissioner Joel Fernandez Garcia to puts forward his questions. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, a greetings to Dr. Santiago Nuevasco. I want to pose a question. You have already explained the situation of your son. 
but I would like to know if it's possible for you to submit the necessities, the need of, of medicine of the rest of the miners that you represent. The needs from from what point of view are you asking? What what needs? Because from the technical point of view, well, I should have the the the, the data for all patients. What what are the needs of providing medicine for the rest of the group? Is the drug being administered or not? At this moment, yes. But as I said before. There was a request last year, or, uh, there was a period last year when uh, patients were without the drug for four months. And as I understand, this had to do with a bureaucratic procedure. Patients should not be affected by such a procedure. There are several uh, officials that are in charge of verifying where the drug uh, or, or the permissions uh, expire. There should be an adequate expiration date so that this situation does not take place. So this is a drug that has to be administered on a daily basis and the period of administration is very long, as you have heard. Ideally, the patient has to receive this from the age of two years old until the age of 18 years old. So there they can reach at least or, or on a minimum an 80% of their growth. That is all on my side. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Um, I now invite my sister commissioner, Lisa Mantilla, to put forward her questions. Thank you very much, Madam President. Good morning to the representatives of the states and to my colleagues and the representatives of the civil society. I want to start by uh, respectfully greeting Mr. Santiago Noé Vasco Morales and through him to his family and his son particularly. It must be very hard to be here. So this is the commission, why the commission values being here. You're being here today because this is another step in a very long struggle. And you, Mr. Vasco, deserve all the respect and a respectful treatment, not a hostile treatment. This is a case hearing, but we never must we should never forget that there's a human being and a story behind this. I want to clarify that. And secondly, you have already said everything that has happened. And in relation with Commissioner Rallon's uh, question on reparations, I wanted to ask on on the damages in the in the life project of your son. Um, with this lack of, of growth due to the lack of the provision of the drug, what's the damage caused on the project of life of your son, but also the impact on the family? What did you ha have to, to leave aside to continue claiming this for such a long time? How has your family life changed? And what's the status of your son at this moment, the, the, the physical, the psychological damage costs. You have some time to to tell us about that. The commission really values your information. Thank you. Well, it's very hard when, when you uh, are waiting for your son to be born, you always expect it uh, to, to be healthy, you always hear these phrases. It doesn't matter if it's a girl or boy. What matters is that he or she is healthy, and and you feel guilty when your son is going through such a disease, and you can you don't know what to do. At least here in Ecuador, this disease was was very rare, and and here people did not know about this disease, and this is not the fault of anyone, and so. You are asking for a personal story, but I was uh, working, uh, assisting patients at my hospital, and then the next day I was as I was the father of a patient because I had uh, the, my, my kid had uh, uh, health issues, and suddenly I had to leave work, and so everyone uh, uh, assisted my son, but. but but I cannot blame them because no one knew of this disease. 
So it's, it was hard. And once we received the diagnosis, when Dr. Guevara helped us with the diagnosis, we started uh, fighting for, for getting the drug, the drug that would help him to overcome this disease. And we had to leave aside many things. Uh, we had to leave our, our son with the, his grandparents because I had a, a, a box where I had all my documents. I went to submit them to all state institutions. I remember that Gabriel had, was five or four years old and he saw me with that suitcase and he told me, are you going to bring me my medicine? I'll be able to grow because he couldn't play because he had to, to stay uh, seated in, in during recess because he was so uh, sh small that there his uh, castmates uh, unwillingly just uh, uh, hurt him and he made him and they made him fall because he was so small. So and when he reached uh, adolescence, uh, we, we started seeing his self uh, perception, his self-esteem. He has uh, some serious psychological uh, problems because of the harassment also, because he's not normal. I remember that some at, at a moment someone said, well, he has to look for a job at, at a circus. So it, it is hard. And I'm, I'm having all these memories back in my mind because sometimes you, you just want someone to listen to you. And some officials said, well, that other patient is worse than yours. And I was saying, well, I'm not competing to, to have the, the worst uh, kid. I'm just claiming for the for the drug for these kids. kids. If I could uh, get the drugs for all of them, well, I would, but I'm I'm here to to fight for for at least this group, and it's true that there are incurable diseases, and you have to to receive your own psychological therapy. But in this case, there was and there is a treatment that could help them. That is what made me despair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. That were all my questions. Uh, thank you. I, I, Because of the emotion involved in the last answer, I decided not to interrupt it. So I will assign to the commission three more minutes since we have to have Commissioner Bernal and the um, Deputy uh, uh, Executive Secretary and Special Rapporteur. I will not ask any questions, but please, Commissioner Bernal, go on. And could you please remind the witness to be as concise as possible? Thank you. Muchas gracias, so Presidenta. Minutes, Yo tengo unas preguntas muy concretas eh, para el declarante a quien envió Thank mi... Thank you, Madam President. I have very specific questions for the witness. I would like to express my solidarity for the situation that uh, he has gone through. As a parent and also as a doctor, I would like to know three things. First, how much this drug costs? What is the cost of a single dose that should be administered to a child every day from two to 18 years old? My second question is whether you are aware of the date in which this drug was approved in Ecuador to be used by patients for human use. And the third question is, as you as a parent of this child, have you started domestic procedures to request economic reparation from the state? Thank you. There are several questions. Could you be as concise as possible, or perhaps you can do your answer in writing later on? Okay. Because we have two more persons to put questions to you. I will be very succinct. Because yeah. of the medicine at an international level, every dose is $1,000. In Ecuador, is $570. US dollars. What? 
was done, I could send this answer in writing because I don't know how to sum up all of them. But we requested economic reparation. No, we have not required any economic reparation so far. Thank you. I we'll think those are the main two answers. Yeah, yes, I will, would look forward to your subsequent answer. Could I invite um, the Deputy Executive Secretary to put your answer, your questions, and then immediately Solidad, and then we'll see what we can do with the answers, please. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Saludar especialmente. Eh, Thank señor... you, Madam President. I would like to greet Mr. Santiago Vasquez. For time restraints, I will not be asking any questions. Thank you. Soledad. Thank you. Soledad. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning to the Honorable State and the representatives of the petitioners. And I would like to greet you. Mr. Santiago, I would like to express my solidarity and also my appreciation for your testimony. I know that this is not easy for you. And also to supplement the questions made by the commissioners, I just want to ask you if all this situation has had any impact on your mental health, on the mental health of your family and on the parties that are included in this petition, if you are aware of them. And I would like to know if you had had any support regarding the care of your son, especially if there is a person like your son that has this syndrome. So maybe this person or your son may have needed um, any care or support. Thank you, Santiago. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Santiago, um, can you answer that in less than a minute? Um, mental impact, mental health impact, yes, for the family life, for my son, especially the self-esteem of my son. He has uh, suffered depression. And when it comes to support or care support, there are no people that could help us psychologically, at least we have not had good results so far. That's all. Thank you so very much. And Mr. Santiago, I join my colleagues in, in uh, empathy with you for what you've gone through and for your son. If I just want to ask you, but to do it in writing later on, if you could write a descriptive uh, script about your son's days, what happens to him each day, what he does, what have what you know that sort of thing so that we could have that to assist us in our understanding of your son's situation and you have a full imp empathy for what you have gone through and your son as well and and uh, but to do that in writing after so i thank you for your statements to us and your answers that you've given and i now have to move on to the next witness and this is um, the evidence of expert witness, Robert, uh, Robert, Robert Davilia Sanchez, offered by the state. And he will testify about Laurent syndrome, the beginning of its study in Ecuador, first de detections, characteristics of the disease and generic analysis. The state will have up to 10 minutes to conduct its in interrogation. Subsequently, the petitioners may interrogate the experts for up to 10 minutes. Finally, the commission will go on to ask questions. Um, the experts, um, I am addressing you now. Please indicate your full name, place of birth, and place of residence. Mr. Sanchez. I see you, but we're not hearing ahí? you. Hello. Can you hear me now? Should, yes. Sí. Si. Yes. Bueno, eh, muy buenos días con todos. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Robert Andres Davila Sanchez. 
I am a doctor uh, and I specialize in genetics. I'm also a family doctor and a general practitioner. I was born in Loja, in the province of Loja in Ecuador. And I am 41 years old right now. Your place of residence. Actualmente, where you live? I currently live in the city of Quito, in the province of Pichincha. Thank you. Um, so, um, delegation of the state, please um, proceed. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Buenos días. Good morning, everyone. No. Mr. Wait a Expert. I, no, no. Wait a minute. I have to swear the witness. Um, Mr. Sanchez, Mr. Sanchez, Mr. Sanchez, Mr. Sanchez. Yeah, um, yes, you, here I am. Do you swear or promise to tell the whole truth and nothing but no the truth? Le escucho. Disculpen, eh, señora Presidenta, no le escucho. Madam President, I can't hear you. Sorry. Do you Would you mind repeating the question? It, I'm I'm asking for your oath. Do you swear to tell the whole truth? I uh, promise to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Do you, Mr. Sanchez? I swear. Me escuchan? Thank you. Please proceed, State. Thank you, Madam President. Mr. Expert, my name is Carola Ricarte and I am representative of the state and will ask you some questions. The first question, what is Laron's syndrome and what is your experience regarding this syndrome as a genetist? Um, due to my training as a clinician, as a genetist, we um, assess several patients with genetic conditions. Among them, we have patients with genetic uh, patients with autosomic uh, cases such as uh, Laron syndrome. And when we have had the opportunity to study genetics, uh, we are a group of four specialists and we have provided care for all patients with low stature and among them, we have attended all those patients who presented the characteristics to be diagnosed with this condition that is Laron's syndrome. Thank you. According to your explanation, could you explain us what a rare disease is and what a catastrophic disease is? We understand that a rare disease is determined as such when the disease is of low prevalence. We are talking about a rare disease when the prevalence is one out of 10,000 inhabitants. An ultra rare disease when the prevalence rate is one every 50,000 inhabitants. And among this, big umbrella name that is rare diseases, 80 to 85% of them are genetic diseases. Um, this, uh, the syndrome, the Laron syndrome is one of them. It is called syndrome, and this is a short clarification. A syndrome is a group of signs and symptoms presented by an individual or patient and may not be a disease or a condition. I just want to make this clarification and that's why we as clinicians and genetists, this is not something that we make up. We talk about genetic conditions, um, taking into consideration the evolution of natural history of each of these patients, taking into consideration different conditions, of course. Uh, having Given this explanation, could you talk about the life expectancy of these patients? Taking into consideration 
patients living with this genetic condition, Laron's syndrome. This is a Mendelian recessive autosomic disease. There is a um, modification of uh, chromosome five, and that makes them have the diagnosis of Laron's syndrome. And we could say that taking into consideration the evolution of their condition, there is no element within their organic functions that would limit their life expectancy when compared with the rest of the population. They are affected by the mutation of this chromosome of this gene what is affected is their growth, their stature. And that is a fundamental characteristic of the phenotype of patients with Laron's syndrome. Thank you. Would you mind telling us where the first diagnosis or assessment is made and when you determine that the stature is low? How you diagnose? Laron's syndrome. Well, what I can say is that all of us as general practitioners, specialists, since we, we have, we start to work, we have the tools to understand the diagnosis of all the patients that are referred to us. We use different tables, we have subsequent consultations or subsequent appointments uh, with the patients. So we know that a patient is born with a certain weight and with a certain stature, and then we continue having subsequent visits or appointments. And we complete the table, uh, the tables of development. And when we when we when patients are not growing enough, we classify them according to percentiles. If the stature is low, we define that, or uh, we define whether the case should be studied or not. According to your expertise, can you tell us what care is received by these people? Talking about the whole group of patients that are diagnosed with um, low stature, stature, from the very beginning, the neonatologist, the general, the general practitioner, or the pediatricians, they do the necessary assessments and they determine whether the patient is within the parameters for further study. And these patients are referred especially when the general practitioner considers that the patient needs support. The pediatrician uh, assesses, but when there is no diagnosis, this especially request the support of endocrinologists, and then different special specialists are called upon to diagnose. Could you tell us what genetic mutations exist uh, against the main study of Dr. Laron, who um, determined the existence of this syndrome. Taking into consideration the studies of Ms. Dr. Laron, uh, among his conclusions, he determined that 69 patients that he studied had a mutation that is called E180, 180, and all have this mutation. And this is an important element to determine the diagnosis for Laron's syndrome, because there are other mutations in other locus. So um, there are some patients that have this mutation in other genes, but they seem to have the syndrome, but they do not have the syndrome. So you can say that the syndrome is still under study, right? And you also mentioned treatment. Could you tell us when the drug is administered for this 
diagnosis. I would like to say first that as a genetist, every patient that has a genetic condition should be assessed from the very beginning of the visit. And since then, the assessment starts and the assessment will continue over his life or their life because genetic variation is so high. Um, when I was uh, getting the training as a genetist, there are no diseases. There are diseased persons. So patients with different, with the same condition can react in different ways to the environment. And the environment includes the treatment. So one of the fundamental criteria to provide treatment to this type of patients is as of two years old, the treatment should start is after two years old. And also it is necessary to prove uh, that the treatment is necessary after conducting hormone studies. And also it's important to conduct genetic studies to determine that there is a mutation of the gene to determine that the patient has Laron syndrome so as not to create any other diseases or conditions when we administrate the drug, which is a membrane receptor, which is missing in these patients. Thank you. So that's the question in, by the state, that's all. Thank you very much. I now invite the petitioners to question the witness. <clears throat> you have 10 minutes as well. Um, thank you, please commence. Gracias, señora Presidenta. Thank you, Madam President. Dr. Davila, I would like to pose a few questions as regards what you have commented. What does the Landrum Landron syndrome have in terms of this disability? What are the impacts? Good morning. Yes, uh, as I said, from the genetist point of view, with this mutation in chromosome 5, the patients with this genetic condition, the Laron syndrome, have the, the, the growth is very uh, affected. So this, of course, makes them unavailable to, to, to uh, live in an environment where the rest of the population with an average height is uh, living. So, however, I would like to say that the functional growth of their muscle and skeletal uh, system and their ne neurological system, everything, um, is developed without any problem. This is why I focus on the issue of stature and height. Thank you. But in Ecuador, the Laron syndrome is this. This is a, a form of disability. It is recognized as such, right? Yes, it is recognized as a disability. Thank you. You have said that there is a specific drug that is for the treatment of this disease. Is it this so? Are you asking that question? Is that correct? Are you asking that question? Yes, of course. I can answer. For patients with this condition, the Laron syndrome, a drug has been established, which is uh, uh, called mescasermine, which is the uh, what's the deficit for these patients with this genetic condition. Thank you, doctor. So when was this drug first available in Ecuador? What's the date? Well, I would like to clarify this. Uh, in 2022, this has been available in Ecuador for these patients. However, I would like to um, focus on the on the object of my uh, statement just just please continue thank you 
So I would like you to uh, say what are the benefits of uh, having this drug for the patients of, uh, with Laron syndrome? Yes, of course. I would like to start by saying that me megasermin, the, uh, this drug is not a drug that will um, cure this genetic condition. This will modify the natural development of this condition and especially will modify the growth of the patient. That is, it will uh, increase what it was had been stopped in these patients, which is uh, stature in this case. Okay, then you mentioned that the benefit is the increase of, of height, right? So it would be correct to say that patients who are not, do not have access to, the, to this drug have been deprived of these benefits. Well, in your question, uh, madam, um, I would like to clarify that this is not the uh, object of my expert statement. As a specialist, I want to refer to, I don't want to refer to that part. Okay, no problem. Then let me ask you another question. Do you know when was megasermin approved by international drug organizations? Commission, that question is also out of order. I think that the doctor is here to speak from the scientific point of view on the disease and not on the uh, the authoriz authorization of the drug. Um, can I can can I, can can we not move on so fast from that um, uh, interpretation because it says that the, the he would testify about the syndrome. The beginning of its study in Ecuador, first detections, characteristics of the disease, and generic analysis. He's supposed to testify in relation to all that, please. Correct. Yes, okay. that's correct. So let me continue with the questions then. You have pointed out that. Uh, what ages should the uh, drugs should be administered? You said from uh, two years of age, but until what age, according to the Ecuadorian protocol? One of these important criteria that uh, we have to follow as specialists and geneticians is this is until the closure of of, uh, of the growth, right? Of uh, the stop of this growth, because there are people who have a, an epiphyseal closure before the expected age, and some of them have a, an epiphyseal closure that uh, is delayed. Um, so that has to that is based on the analysis. This is why we are involved as specialists in genetics, because these patients require this uh, consultancy because. This drug does not have any detailed research that uh, support the fact that, well, this is the uh, side effects. There are other side effects that appear once the drug is administered. We require studies over time, but, but the problem is that the drug does not have all this support. There are no people who are devoted to studying it in detail. But one of the important criteria is this epiphyseal closure, which is when up the age up to which the drug can be administered for Laron syndrome patients. Okay, thank you. But the, this is my question. It was clear. The Ecuadorian okay. protocol, what is the age that it establishes as uh, the, the limitation? Should I answer? Yes, please. So answering the question of madam, according to the protocol, it's estimated that this has been has to be administered until this epiphyseal closure. In this case, the megasermin. So let me pose the question again. The uh, manufacturer, what's the age that they establish? We are running out of time. Doctor, expert with this. You are asked up to what age should the drug be administered? Age, in age. Pure in Spanish would be clear. 
Ep what this well, no. epidural closure or what have you doesn't mean anything to us. We're not doctors. So we need to know the age in terms of years. Thank you. In terms numericos, estamos yes, hablando... the age. Well, we're speaking possibly until 18 years of age. We have to assess or see or to prove whether there is an epiphyseal disclosure or not. This is why I was commenting this. There are no diseases, but diseased people, because not all patients uh, show that uh, epiphyseal closure at that age, at 18 years of age. So some of them have that uh, before, so that the um, drug will not be effective after that age. And some patients have that uh, closure after that limit. So the, the drug can be administered longer and it will uh, uh, have an effect. Thank you. You have also commented that the drug uh, arrived in Ecuador in 2020. And given your knowledge of the patients for the study that you have uh, performed, according to what you have uh, stated, um, do you know if there are any patients with Laron syndrome that have had already reached uh, or or have were already adults in 2020? Well, in relation with that question, I can answer the following. Yes, I do have expertise because I was in the territory, not only in a hospital. Uh, uh, I have walked the territory. I don't know all of them, but I do know a great number of patients and their parents, uh, patients with Laron syndrome. Of course, I also know how some of them are uh, for example, managers of cooperatives, they have their professions. Many of them are uh, living in good terms. But the question that you're asking is if I know any patients. Well, well I do have knowledge of patients uh, who are adults who have this Laurent syndrome and due to uh, genotype issues, maybe they have diabetes and they have been under treatment for years. Um, after Dr. Leron, after the research that was uh, conducted here in Ecuador with the patients with the syndrome, we saw that these patients have uh, protection in the face of, of diabetes or cancer. This is what the research said. But however, we have adult patients that are uh, that have these conditions as well. Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, since we don't have uh, much time, I want to pose the last question. You are a public I, I official, you right? I don't have the extra time since I interrupted. I had to intervene. So you have two more minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Please go on. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, so answering your question, yes, I am a public official. You work in Segemed, right? This is, uh, what, what's the nature of the institution? Sehemed is the special center for uh, genetics. This is part of the Ministry of Health of the, of the state of Ecuador. So it would be correct to say that the state is your employer, right? Could you repeat the question? There was an interruption. Yes, sure. It, would it be correct to say that the state is your employer? Well, since I am a, I am a geneticist and I work at this institution, yes, it's correct, I would think. Thank you, Madam President. That's all from our side. Madam President, I think your mic is off, so maybe the team can support us and to I beg activate. Your pardon. I my, my hand sometimes goes twice. Um, I call upon um, uh, uh, Commissioner Stuart while on the country rapporteur pose these questions. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Thank you very much, Madam President. I have two questions. 
first. What are the effects on a person with Laron syndrome uh, when they do not receive the Incralex drug before their adolescence? And are those effects reversible? Can they be reverted? And second, what is the effectiveness of that drug when it is administered in uh, children over 12 years of age? Those would be my question. Thank you. So answering your first question, when you ask if the uh, if the drug is administered in during adolescence, is that correct? Okay, then if it is administered during adolescence, and as I was explaining before, in order to administer the, the drug, there are specific criteria to be complied with. One of them is that there is no epiphyseal closure. If this is administered in adolescence, but there is no closure, evidently we will see a positive result in, re in regard to uh, the stature, but that depends on the response on the patient's organism. It's not something that is two plus two equals four. In medicine, all of us who study medicine know that two plus two is not four. It all depends on the response on the patient, then on complying with the criteria. So in adolescence, if the patient uh, complies with this criteria of a non-closure, evidently there will be a response, but that depends on the patient. That the, was the first question. The second question that you posed, could you repeat it, please? Yes, the second question is whether there are any effects that can be reversed or, or if this drug was not administered in a timely manner. That is that time that was wasted. Is this irreversible or not? I guess that your question has to do with the following. That is, if the patient reached an age and they were not given the drug, but it, it's proven that he, they already comply with the criteria of non-closure, what happens with that time where they did not receive the drug? That is your question? Okay, then my answer as a specialist in genetics is in line with what I already commented first. We have to verify that they comply with the criteria. The patient complies with the criteria, they are given them the drug. Let's uh, say that they were not given this throughout their childhood, but there are no studies that prove that if the patient was not administered the drug for an amount of months or years, and a specific thing will happen because there are patients that could receive this when they are two years old and maybe they have grown just five centimeters when they reach 18 years old and there are patients that could receive this when they are adolescents and maybe they could have grown 20 centimeters when the the closure happens so it's very relative it's not two plus two equals five is equals four there is there are no lab studies or scientific studies that support this. This is why as a geneticist, I also want to mention by virtue of your question that when Dr. Svilaron did this molecular study, all of the patients had this specific mutation. However, in the Ecuadorian study, on top of this mutation, there is a new mutation. So that means that there's a genetic variability and therefore there's a response, a non-expected response or a different response that that was was expected. So this is technical, but this is why I'm here to, to focus on the technical aspects. And I can say that the response depends on the patients, it depends on their genotype and on epiphyseal closure or the non-closure in this case. Thank you, uh, Madam President. That are those are all my questions. Um, thank you. I now invite uh, um, uh, Commissioner uh, Juan Hernandez. 
please to intervene. En aras del tiempo, sea presente. So to keep with time, I will not ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I Thank now invite tonight our sister commissioner Julissa Mantilla to intervene. A ver, eh, presidenta. Presidenta. Madam President, I'm sorry. This is Esmeralda. Yeah, Commissioner Arasemena oh, is, is intervening. Yes. Yes, um, Commissioner Esmeralda, we are seriously out of time. We are out of time. So could you be as succinct as you can? Thank you. Can you hear me? No. No me escucha? Uh, a ver, me escuchan? Can you hear me? I, I hear the interpreter asking, can you hear me? Okay, then uh, if you can hear me, I'll say this. Just one question for the expert. In uh, your expertise, what is the assessment that you make? of the current situation in terms of effectiveness, the need and the importance of the administration of this drug. You have said that this drug does not cure the disease. It's only a solution so that this deficiency can be addressed. So then what is your assessment in the sense? Could I ask the um, witness to answer this question in writing later? We really do not have time because the submissions have to be made as well. So we would ask you to write your answer, please. I now invite Commissioner Julissa Mantilla. Yes, Madam President, just very specific uh, yes and no questions to see if I understood. So you said, Expert first, thank you for being here. You said that the uh, life expectancy does not change uh, for those who, who do not have the syndrome and those who have, but the quality of life does change, right? That's correct, yes. Second, you also say that there is no two plus two equals four, and I understand that correct perfectly, but that depends on the epiphyseal closure. Is that correct? Yes. But we could say that uh, the youngest, the better, right? Yes, as I explained, please, please, could you say uh, it, it doesn't matter if this is applied when they are three years old or 35 years old, we cannot have that certainty because there are no studies. Yes, but of what you have seen, the case that you have observed, the, the, the epiphyseal closure that you have observed, what can you say about that? I can say that there are patients that have received uh, the drug when they were very young and they have been receiving this for a long time and they have not grown more than two centimeters. And there are patients who are adolescents and have received the same drug for the same time and they have grown 15 centimeters. So just a closure, Madam President, you do recommend that they receive the drug, right? Yes, of course, all patients with Laurent syndrome have to have received the, doc the drug, okay. Thank you, that's all, Madam President. Um, yes, I now invite Commissioner Carlos Bernal to intervene. Muchas gracias. Dos preguntas muy concretas Thank para you. Usted. I have two specific questions for you, doctor. I don't know if you know the file of this case and if, in your opinion, the petitioners have complied with the requirements for accessing this drug. And I don't know if you are aware of the estimate number of how many people have Laron syndrome in Ecuador. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. With regard to your first question, uh, that is outside the object of my expertise. This is something that um, is relevant for you. And with regard to the second question, as I was explaining during my presentation, I have had the pleasure to diagnose and to visit the houses of these patients. And what I can say is that I don't know personally each of the patients. I know many of them and they have registered and the public health ministry has identified them. And the multidisciplinary team um, that disperses the treatment is well aware of this, of them. 
and I was in charge of preparing the studies that the multidisciplinary team has to take to these patients, doctor. Um, terminar. Are you done? Are you? Yes, I'm as I'm waiting to find out. Commissioner uh, 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 Bernal, uh, are you finished? Yes. Thank you. I now yes, invite um, Deputy uh, um, Executive um, Secretary Jose Mesa to put his questions and following him, um, Solidad Garcia Menos, the Special Rapporteur. Muchas gracias, señora Presidenta, de manera muy concreta y para que Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I would like for the expert to write to answer in writing. We have identified that there is a protocol entitled administration of the drug uh, for patients with Laron syndrome. You told us there shouldn't be a specific age for receiving this treatment. And you tell us that uh, the beneficial closure should be proved before administering the drug. So uh, my question is if you need medical check for that. I would like to be very specific with the answer. There is a protocol. If it's in writing, it would be better. There is a protocol that reads administration of mecasermin clinical patients with Laron syndrome. It's from two years old until the closure. That's a current um, method. That would be my answer. Thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you. Um, I now invite our special rapporteur, Solidar Garcia, to intervene and put her questions. <coughs> thank you, Madam President. I want to be very specific too. Good morning, um, doctor. I would like to confirm if the treatment is fully free for persons with Laron syndrome. And if there is any record so that the state is aware of how many people have the syndrome uh, in the national territory. Thank you, Madam uh, Rapporteur, for your answer. Yes, the drug is administered for free when the patients have been diagnosed with Laron's syndrome. And also there is a national record of all the patients and the dose, the dose that they need to be administered, but also each multidisciplinary team has information and detailed information about what is requested for the studies and the tests. No sé si respondí su I don't know if I answered your question with that. Yes, thank you. I think that this information should be conveyed to the commission if it's not already available in the file of the case. Are you finished? Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you very much. Um, I will not ask any questions of the witness at this stage. Um, I now invite the parties to make their submissions and um, the um, representatives of the petitioners first, and you will have 15 minutes to do so. And um, then the state will have 15 minutes as well to do so. Gracias, señora Presidenta. Thank you, Madam President. First of all, well, can we I tell like... you once we will be finishing at one o'clock instead? We'll extend the time to one. Thank you. Please go on. Thank you, President. Eh, para comenzar, nosotros Fifteen minutes. Dejamos... Thank you. Commencing now. Gracias. Para comenzar, to begin with, we would like to share with you a video.
Uh -huh. eh, mi nombre es Gabriel Alejandro Vasco. My name is Gabriel Alejandro Vasco. At 17 years old, I measure 1.24 meters. Now I'm 20. And after receiving the drug for three years, more or less, I am 1.40 meters. Uh, if I had received the medicine at two years old, I think that the situation would have been totally different. I would have a normal stature that I think is around 1.60 meters. Um, I suffer constant pain of not being able to participate in savannah activities, of not being able to celebrate my birthdays as, as other people. I having so many barriers to access a drug that would benefit a part of the population. And these are part of the population. We deserve to have a normal life, a, li a full life. I think that not having acted in the right way is selfish. My father told me that there were a lot of bureaucratic barriers, that they found excuses. And if there were excuses, sometimes the issues were resolved beforehand. So I think that their attitude was in bad faith and selfish. Since 2007, there were several requests uh, from the state of Ecuador for the track. The issue that we are seeing is that this drug cannot be sold to individuals. If he would have received the track since he was two years old, maybe we could have avoided the disability. We could have reverted his situation, but unfortunately we were not heard. In 2010, a group of parents of the children with the disease sued the state in a successful manner. But 10 years later, the drug was uh, purchased. This happened in 2020. The state do not comply, did not comply with their obligation. Commissioners, my name is Osvaldo Ruiz. As you have heard today, the Laron syndrome is a form of dwarfism, is a rare and highly complex disease that is related to a deficit of stature and affects the autonomy and dignity of people who suffer this disease. In Ecuador, it is considered a disability. This disease can be treated with mecasermin and until the closure of the epiphysis. A person using the drug can grow as a child, six centimeters every year. This medicine had been approved by the FDA in early 2000s. Ecuador, although a small country, houses a third of the population of Laron syndrome. This makes it a public health issue and the state of Ecuador has not been responsible in its management. And as a result, the rights of several patients have been violated, and that's why we are here today. I would like to say that we are not here to discuss the fact that since 2020, the state of Ecuador has bought the drug for the patients. The goal of our discussion are the following. First, the reparation that the state owes for those patients whose growth stage had concluded by 2020, and therefore they could not benefit from the drug in the country, or they could benefit only for a few years. And after this hearing, we will send a list of all the victims. However, according to the last report of the Public Health Ministry to the Constitutional Court of Ecuador in January 23, 2023, there is a record of 40 patients over 18 years old that cannot receive the treatment anymore. So we would like to send you the list of 47 patients because they are all victims. Um, secondly, for the patients under 18 years old, there should be a guarantee that the drug is administered without any interruptions. 
2022, however, the patients were not able to access the drug for four months. Commissioners, my name is Gabriela Flores. I am appearing as representative of the victims. During my intervention, I will talk first about the facts of the case, and then I will talk about the violations of human rights. The Laron syndrome is a disease that exists in Ecuador for many decades, but since 2007, a group of parents led by Santiago Vasco decided to request or to demand the supply of the drug from the state because they could not access to the drug by its their own means. This drug should have been bought by the state. After their demands, the petitioners only file, only faced no's. Then they filed a writ of amparo and the state was ordered to adopt several measures, including the supply of the medical treatment that is necessary for the patients, according to item C of the ruling that you can see on the screen. Unfortunately, several years went by without any compliance with this ruling. In 2014, the patients presented a remedy of lack of compliance. That is a constitutional remedy to demand compliance with the ruling. In 2016, the Constitutional Court declared that the ruling was not being complied with and ordered the state to provide the treatment. You can see the resolution on the screen. And again, the state did not comply with this second resolution. The Constitutional Court issued two additional orders requesting the provision of the drug. Then, at the end of 2020, finally, the drug was supplied. So between 2007, when the first uh, actions were initiated and the end of 2020, when the drug was supplied, 13 years went by, during which the patients with Laron syndrome did not have access to the med. Although the state has mentioned some actions that they took to provide the drug, all those actions occurred after 2016, after the second ruling of the Constitutional Court. That is, between 2007 and 2016, the state said nothing. They did not take any actions to obtain the draft. Although the first legal order or blue ruling was already in force. And the lab which manufactured the drug offered uh, a negotiation and also offer the drug for free for some patients, but the state was not answering to the lab. Um, the position of the state facing the actions, uh, the state alleges that they have implemented some actions to provide the drug. However, these actions were useless, negligent, and the patients lost valuable time as they grow. Regarding the um, health record that is considered the first obstacle to obtain the drug, the record was obtained in 2018. And the situation is clear. There was no need for a record for this type of record. According to the health law that was enforced in 2015, a permission uh, for an expert would have been enough. So there were two years of delay that were unnecessary. Regarding the purchase of the drug in 2018-2019, the state wasted time negotiating the price. According to the Ministry of Health and the report in 2019, we see that the actions of negotiation were fruitless and only delayed the application of the ruling. Um, direct purchase could have been done, which would have been quicker. So we see the lack of action of the state until 2016 and the unnecessary actions of the state between 2016 and 2020. And this delayed the treatment that should have been administered to the patients. Commissioners, I would like to talk about rights that were violated. I will talk about articles 26, 4, 5, 25, and 19 of the 
Convention and 11 of the American Declaration. Although the Commission included Articles 8 and 24 in the admissibility report. Regarding the right to health, it is important to say that this is an enforceable right and the state actions were wrong. Taking into consideration the case Lagos against Peru, the Inter-American Court has talked about the enforceability of the rights. The special rapporteur has indicated that is, this was a historical step. The obligation to respect and protect are enforceable for all rights, whether they are political, civil, economic, social rights. So the actions of the states were incompatible with the convention. Also, the convention calls upon guaranteeing the highest level of well-being. Also, the Inter-American Court recognized that the states are forced to guarantee quality health care and that access to drugs is also a part of the right to health. According to general comment 14 of the ESCR committee, one of the essential elements that should um, characterize uh, the role of the state is providing all the elements of health care, including drugs. According to the committee, drugs should be available for those patients who need them. Also taking into consideration the principle of progressiveness that is related to the right to health, considering the Inter-American jurisprudence, this dimension implies a sense of progress and the states are forced to guarantee the best enjoyment of economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. Also the Inter-American court condemned uh, or sentenced the state of Guatemala for not purchasing the drug that uh, patients needed and the same situation has happened in this case. Providing the drug before 2020 implied a violation of the right to health of the patients. In light of the inter-American jurisprudence and taking into consideration the principle of interdependence of, the, of human rights, the right to health is related to the right to dignified life and to integrity. In the case of Chucky Axa against Paraguay, the court has said that the violations of the right to health have an impact on the right to a dignified life. We have the case Vera Vera against Ecuador, in which the court has said that the state obligation to provide dignified conditions of life is translated in the duty to guarantee health care to patients with serious diseases. And as it has been recognized in the Jimenez Lopez against Brazil case, a state should preserve the autonomy and dignity of patients. The witness explained this very clearly. The drug helps to improve the stature of the patients. And it's not about uh, looking nice. It's about autonomy of living without depending on others in a world that is not thought for them. It provides benefits for their physical and mental integrity. And therefore, in the instant case, the beneficiaries who are already adults and who have to face the effects of the disease are the ones whose rights to integrity and to life have been violated. Also, the Ecuador had general obligations towards patients taking into consideration Article 19 of the Convention. According to one of the rulings of the Inter-American Court against Uruguay, um, the states are guarantors of human rights and they should be more responsible in the case of children, considering the best interest of the child since the decision um, had an effect on children in a situation of vulnerability, their situation should have been a priority for the state. Without any doubts, delaying access to medical treatment for over 13 years implied a violation of the rights considered in Article 19 of the Convention. Finally, I would talk about the right to judicial protection. According to the court in the case Baina Ricardo, one 
of the implications is that a state should guarantee the means to guarantee judicial protection because the state responsibility only finishes when there is a realization of the rights declared. The state did not comply with two rulings that order the uh, provision of the drug, the writ of Amparo in 2010, and also the ruling of the Constitutional Court in 2016. In the court has also said that there is a violation of the Article 25 when the state does not comply with a ruling for a long period of time. And this delay implies a violation of Article 25 of the Convention. To conclude, I need to highlight that the Inter-American Court has resolved in the case Duque against Colombia, rejecting um, the religious uh, argument uh, proposed by the state. So because modifying a public policy after uh, a ruling is not enough. We need to consider whether the victim has been fully repaired or not. So purchasing the medicine as of 2020 is not enough. Taking into consideration the case of Velázquez Rodríguez, any violation that has led to harm implies the duty to repair. And this is one of the elements of state responsibility. Taking into consideration the patients who had no access to the med medicine suffer damages to their health that are irreversible and they should be repaired and they are waiting reparation. So taking into consideration all the arguments, we need to declare the violation of Article 4858. I'm afraid I have to stop you here. You're over two minutes over time and you do have five more minutes uh, in after the state submits, okay? I now call upon the states to make their submissions 15 minutes and you do have the two minutes extra time which the petitioner's representative used. Thank you. Please proceed. Muchas gracias, señora Presidenta. Thank you very much, Madam President. Commissioners, representatives of the alleged victims, alleged victims who are here at this hearing. In this case, in in the instant case, there is the international obli uh, obligation of the state of Ecuador for alleged uh, violation of human rights for patients with the syndrome of Laron in Ecuador. The problem is that petitioners in this instant case are reduced in the right to integrity and health for persons with syndrome with Laron syndrome to an acquisition of one drug manufactured by one specific laboratory. In that sense, what well, the lawyers have tried to present before the illustrious uh, commission at this hearing is a case with absolute certainty on the disease, but mainly on the drug and on the efficiency of the drug. Those certainties are not uh, in line with the scientific studies that exist on the drug up to date. The studies conducted by Mr. Guevara, who was presented at this uh, hearing as the main researcher in Ecuador, and the studies uh, conducted by the same pharmaceutical company that is manufacturing the, the drug. So in that sense, in this hearing, we are seeking to submit before the Inter-American Commission the elements that should allow it to address comprehensively a situation that is truly complex and without any absolute truths a show and evidence of the complexity of the syndrome and of the unawareness of this disease is when the lawyers of the patients of this uh, uh, of the syndrome when they requested this at an international level they requested this to be uh, declared as a catastrophic disease and then they ratify this information because the Laron syndrome does not comprise it's not uh, does not constitute a catastrophic disease so in this framework, in the framework of complexity and lack of certainty on the disease and the drug and its efficiency, the Ecuadorian state has adopted the measure 
it's to guarantee the rights of the persons with the Laurent syndrome, which has meant comprehensive and ongoing assistance through the provision of uh, health uh, services and a multidisciplinary treatment, and especially the, the assistance that the state has provided on each of the uh, of the patients. There is documents, there are documents that will be submitted to the commission so that they can transfer it to the petitioners. Before this uh, request, as regards the acquisition of one single drug that does not cure the disease and whose defects continue to be the subject of analysis, the state was in the obligation to guarantee both the quality and the safety of the drug and also the compliance with the internal norms with regard to uh, public uh, purchase. So. Experimenting with patients is not a right that should or can be demanded from the states. As regards to the drug itself, there are no single studies that support the certainties that have been presented as regards the their its efficiency on uh, patients. There are no single studies that support this expectancy that has been uh, generated by the pharmaceuticals and the lawyers with regard to the effect that it could have had according to this the age that it was going to be administered. So, uh, and, and conversely, the side effects of these drugs continue to be studied. So the lab itself requested that the side effects are reported still. So there are patients with Lawrence's syndrome that have refused to receive this drug for those side effects. So first the state will present technical information and then it will address some legal aspects with regard to this case. I give the floor to my colleague at the Ministry of Health. Uh, greetings, I'm Fernando Cruz Quispe, uh, specialist in family uh, medicine, in uh, genetics and uh, public administration. We have spoken about the Laron syndrome. This is a condition that is one among the 6,000 diseases uh, classified as rare diseases, which are, have low prevalence because they are chronic, because potentially they can cause a disability, because they affect several systems and organi organisms, because it's complex to address them, and because they require multidisciplinary assistance, and because they are uh, complex to treat, and many of the specific drugs to treat them have, are still on an experimental stage. So addressing this, represents a challenge for all health systems and for all states at the world level. This is a reality that is not only for the Ecuadorian state, but actually for the whole world. The Ministry of Health, of health has performed different efforts to address these conditions. For example, uh, early diagnosis uh, and, and efforts that started in 2011, and they have been at least uh, more than 300 people that have been diagnosed with rare diseases with $42 million investments. As regards this uh, timely diagnosis in 2017, the special center in, in genetics, Segemed, was created and it has allowed for the diagnosis of 2,500 uh, patients. As regards the treatment, the Ministry of Health is investing 260 million for drugs in its health centers. $8.5 million are invested specifically on drugs that are found out of the national basic medicine scheme. This is expected to double in 2024. So it's uh, close to $16 million. And as regards surveillance and monitoring of these conditions, in October 2022, the registry of persons with rare diseases was implemented to establish the prevalence and the geographic distribution of these conditions, and especially to be able to plan adequately of the, the measures that should be taken. So let me conclude by saying that the comprehensive addressing of these diseases 
constitutes a challenge for all states. Now we will give the floor to Dr. Lucia Ceballos. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lucia Ceballos. I'm a public official. I'm a, 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 I'm a doctor. Uh, the Ministry of Public Health provides uh, assistance to Laron syndrome uh, patients through all uh, its health centers that are part of the national health system. Thanks to that uh, assistance, we were able to uh, conduct diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up on patients who have already received a diagnosis. At the moment, we have 60 people who have been diagnosed definitely with Laron syndrome and with a uh, present diagnosis of 17 persons. The Ministry of Health is uh, doing a survey of information at the national level where we see the age of the patient, the dose that has been uh, prescribed, and, and this is necessary to uh, assess individually uh, and also to provide the drug for 12 months. When we have this estimate, we uh, certify exclusively the monetary value to be allocated for the acquisition of the drug. With regard to the provision of the drug before the administration, there's a series of uh, medical assessments on different special areas to determine what's the health uh, status of the person. If it's to be determined that there are any alterations to this, we go back to the pathology and we go to the stage of administration. During the administration stage, first, this is done within the hospital because we need to identify what will be the effective dose for the patient. And we have to have a sub constant support from the health staff and to be able to identify the symptoms that could appear the, uh, after the administration. Uh, so that we can also train legal representatives and family members to, so that they can know how that dose will be administered at home. What's the, and what is the dose after the release uh, and after being uh, for five days at the hospital? The drug is administered directly by legal representatives because it has to be administered every twelve hours but they will have the support of the specialist uh, doctors. At home, we also provide training as regards how they have to correctly administer the drug, how they have to uh, remove the devices. And I say this because the drug has to be uh, adequately managed. That is, they have to be, it has to be refrigerated. Uh, also, we conduct assessments and evaluations and, and checkups. There are uh, checkups every two and six months. Also, we provide consent with each legal representative so that they can have first-hand information on what is the treatment that we will be uh, undergoing and what could be the side effects or the adverse effects after the administration. This also is useful so that we can estimate that they uh, have all the information necessary. We have 21 persons under treatment ever 2022. And for next year, we have identified four new persons that are starting the treatment with this new acquisition. When we purchased this drug in 2020, we estimated that we needed uh, drugs for 18 persons who had uh, accepted the drug. Once we got the drug, they signed the informed consent. And then when they started treatment, one person rejected the treatment despite having had the drug allocated without any without presenting any pathology or adverse effect. So far there have been five persons with this same adverse uh, symptom, which is a serious uh, uh, a symptom.
After having heard the intervention of the Ministry of Health officials who explained clearly all the measures taken by the Ecuadorian state in compliance with their uh, international obligation in favor of Laron syndrome patients, I will refer to two legal aspects. First, the lack of determination of the alleged victims. This situation has extended ever since the, the petition was filed and up to date. In 2011, petitioners filed a petition in favor of 30 alleged victims, but in during the admissibility stage, they only provided data for eight children. This situation was also observed by the Inter-American Commission, which in its admissibility report pointed that the identification of the totality of the victims has to be determined with evidence during the merit stage, which is the stage we are currently in. However, the petitioners Without complying with this requirement by the commission, they presented a, a list of 20 alleged victims, pointing to the fact that this is not an uh, uh, complete list and that they will inform this in, at a later stage. However, the identity and the number of the alleged victims continue to be uncertain. This situation continues to, to expand over time, and this can... Uh, the Ecuadorian state has an obligation to inform the commission the individual situation of each of the alleged victims, and it has provided evidence on the victims to which we have information. So I will refer to a second uh, procedural aspect, which is the un inadequate incorporation of alleged victims for which the the time period is not applicable. And what do I mean by this? In 2011, there was an attempt to, to present a, a report without identifying the specific alleged victims. And then in 2020, they pointed to 20 alleged victims out of which 10 had not been born at the moment when the petition was filed. And why is this relevant? Because the protect the sentence for the protection uh, action is 2020. The petition was filed in 2011. The sentence of the in compliance was presented in 2016. This alleged victim was born in 2018. So in none of these previous stage, they participated. In 2020, the alleged victim was two years old. And this is when Inca Lakes arrived in Ecuador. However, their parents, knowing that the, the drug could be administered uh, up to the official's closure, they voluntarily decided to administer the straw when the girl was four years old, that is in 2022. This case clearly shows how the alleged uh, infringement of human rights of these alleged victims were not happening because the the framework, the time framework for these alleged victims is not applicable to them. This is why we request that when the petitioners uh, provide the details of all alleged victims, they have to point to how these victims are included in this time period and how the Ecuadorian states uh, should supposedly uh, infringe their human rights. That is all on my side. Thank you. Can you hear us? Were you able to hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, the state has completed their submissions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you now have <clears throat> you now have time to make uh, petitioners to make a reply. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the state will have time the same time to make a rejoinder. Um, this, I'm sorry, I have to now give you three minutes each instead of five minutes. Thank you. So the petitioners of three minutes for your reply. Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, Madam President. Some issues that I think we have to emphasize are the following. First, it seems as if, as if there is a confusion. This is not a catastrophic disease. It's a rare disease and highly complex as it, as it was uh, recognized by the state in 2012. This has been incorporated into the file. And with regard to this disease, the state has tried to 
say that this is a minor case. Ecuador is the country with the most prevalence of this disease in the world. 80 of the 300 patients in the world are living in Ecuador. A third of the global patient population is living here. How is going? How is this going to be a minor problem for Ecuador? And the and the treatment for this is at least as uh, as we have uh, been able to do so is this drug. And apparently, the Ecuadorian state has forgotten that this was recognized in F by the FDA in 2005. This is the, the drug to treat this disease, and this was validated in all judicial stages in Ecuador. So in this year, the state questioning this sort of things is, is unprecedented. Even when their own experts have, have said that they recommend this drug for these patients. So to answer specifically on the uh, provision of details on the alleged victims that you mentioned at the end, I think it's important to say that uh, in the admissibility report, the commission was very clear. Providing the details of the victims has to be done during the marriage stage, which is not concluded. So the representatives have still time to, uh, conclude in, to conclude with this provision of details, but we do have the registry of the parents who are organized, but the knowledge of who are the patients that are over 18 years old since 2020, and that as a consequence of the state inefficiency, we're not able to access the drug. Well, this information is in the hands of the state and not in the hand, hands of the victim. So the state is requested to provide this information that, so that we can truly know who the victims are. So to conclude, I would like to say that up to date, after 15 years since the actions were fired, no responsible people have been determined. There have not been any administrative, administrative uh, summaries and no reparation has been given to the victims. This is why we request the commission to have this petition accepted and to impose the reparation measures. We had requested that this was going to be an indemnization for or, or, or recompensation for the victims who are adolescents or what adolescents are in 2020, also psychological support and public apologies and other any other thing that the commission may consider fit. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now invite the state to make its rejoinder, if he so wishes, three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to start as the representatives of the petitioners started, explaining the confusion whether this disease was a rare disease or a catastrophic disease. And I would like to start here because this misunderstanding existed also uh, among the lawyers of the patients with Laron syndrome when they presented their actions before the state of Ecuador they demanded that Laron syndrome is considered a catastrophic disease. And then the lawyers decided not to request this because it does not compromise the life of the patient. I also would like to make reference to a comment of the victims that this that they say that this is a minor issue for the state of Ecuador. And that is not the case. That's why the state is always participating uh, in the hearings and the state of Ecuador has shown its openness with regard to the treatment for rare diseases and to guarantee multidisciplinary treatment for Laron syndrome patients. And also we presented information regarding what uh, have been the actions of the state of Ecuador. And also I would like to refer to the certainty regarding the efficacy and effectiveness of the treatment. And it's necessary to make reference to that certainty that has been created in the patients and among their family members. They have the certainty that if they had received the treatment before, they would have had a better life. 
And the state is clear about that. There are no certainty about that. The studies of Mr. Guevara presented as the main researcher of this disease show that 80% of the average of a normal estature can be achieved using the treatment. And um, one of the patients achieved more than the limit established by Mr. Guevara in his studies. And there are cases of persons who received the treatment when they were younger and still they don't grow enough. So the petitioners are not proven with scientific evidence, the allegations that they are accusing the state of in order to um, indicate that the state of Ecuador has international responsibility. This includes information regarding the health record, regarding the national exports, all are allegations regarding domestic legislation. We will send you the information in writing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was going to um, suggest that to both sides um, that uh, you send your additional points to us in writing. I now, in <clears throat> sorry, I now invite the commissioners um, to um, ask whatever questions and make any closing comments as succinctly as possible. You now, we now have 10 minutes to do that. In fact, that's being very generous. Thank you. 10 minutes for the commission. Oh, I beg your pardon. You know the order first, com, um, country rapporteur, and then first vice president. Muy amable, president. Muy fina. Thank you, Madam President. In fact, I don't have further questions, but I think it has been a hearing in which we have received plenty of information. And because of time restraints, there is a missing, there is some missing information. So we request the parties to share that information with us in writing so we can assess that information. So I'd like to thank all those who participated at this hearing. Esmeralda, please, I'm, I'm going to be very informal now and very quick. Esmeralda? Is she there? Hello? Esmeralda? Are you hearing her? Interpreters? No, Esmeralda is not here, I think. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Joel? Presidenta, de las explicaciones Madam que President, hay... taking into consideration the explanations of the state, I have no clarity about the reasons why during 13 years they did not supply the drug in spite of the fact that there were different rulings. I think that this should have been explained so that we can understand uh, the effectiveness of the drug. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up so that the state can deal with it in writing. Um, Co Commissioner Polisa. Thank you, Madam President. To be very succinct, I just want to remind the state of something. Considering the information that the Commission has, on August the 12th, 2020, the plenary of the Constitutional Court verified that some of the obligations uh, were complied with, but with an excessive delay. The Constitutional Court has established that there was an excessive delay in complying with the ruling. That is the information. I would like for the state to confirm this, or if this is not true. No, Commissioner. No, no, no. Please, uh, unless you can say yes or no, please. Yes? We need to review the obligations established in each of the rulings. The assessment requires a response in writing. You can send 
a response in writing, but please, I have read the ruling of the Constitutional Court. The court has said that there has been an excessive delay and we want the state to explain in writing if they are agreeing with their own Constitutional Court. And in writing, I would like to request the petitioners how they would request reparation and non-repetition guarantees. And I also echo the Commissioner Hernandez and his words. There is no clarity or no exploitation for this excessive delay. The very expert of the state, when I asked him if the patient should have received the medicine, the drug, he said yes. And I want that that is included in our records. Thank you. Thank Madam you. President, I just want to uh, make a very short clarification. The Constitutional Court, one of the judges, was one of the petitioners of this case, has explained that the Constitutional Court, because of the complexity for the compliance of that measures, needed to present several documents and briefs to modulate the way in which the rulings should have been complied with. The Constitutional Court has shown the complexity of the case. And one of its rulings, um, they explained that there should be not only one single drug, but several drugs at the disposal of the patients. That still does Madam not Madam President, does I just want to clarify point. something. Uh, Can I clarify something? Not, not to this, uh, I, I will give you 50 seconds to do so, but we're not going to have an argument now. The judge excused from the case from the very beginning. And secondly, the content of those decisions is in writing. So the representative of the state is just trying to interpret the constitutional court. Madam President, I just want to highlight the delay yes. explained by the court. That, that, I got that point. That's why I, I, I intervened. Um, Commissioner um, Bernal. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Dos Thank you very much, Madam President. I have two very specific questions for the petitioners. First, if with regard to the compensation request or petition, have you initiated any domestic actions and if those actions are in force? And the second question, one of the requirements of these domestic actions have to do with the proof of the causes of the harm. So please send us relevant information, but please in one minute, let us know what proof you have of the causes of the harm with regard to the victims that are documented in the file. Thank you. Within a minute, if you cannot, you can ask to do it in writing, but, but time is going. Señora Presidenta, preferimos Madam President, we believe that it's better to re respond this in writing because of the complexity of the response. And I'm sure my brother commissioner will not deny you that right. Um, uh, um, Deputy Assistant uh, um, Secretary, are you still here? Oh yes, there you are. Uh, please intervene. And you must do at this stage. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Solo quisiera... Thank you, Madam President. I just want to thank the petitioners and the representatives of Ecuador for their interventions. And I would like to request the state to present its comments and observations in writing and to provide the information requested by the petitioners regarding the population and the persons that identify or have been diagnosed with the syndrome. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Special Rapporteur Solidar. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Muy brevemente. Thank you, Madam President. I want to be very succinct. I just want to thank, and since this is a case that involves the right to health, and the right to health covers psychological and physical aspects, I would like to know if the state has any specific mechanism to provide psychological support for patients with Laron syndrome. And since that in Ecuador, 
Laron syndrome is a disability. I would like to know if you have a specific measures to protect persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just I'll just say this, and and then I want you to keep your cameras open for a photograph to be taken, and after that we close the session. And this is what all I have to say. I adopt what my colleagues have have put before you, uh, um, in totality. I I don't want to waste time to repeat anything all that, except to say this: that it is unfortunate that a case like this, which involves the life and, and, uh, and, and as the value of life of children who have a health problem has come to this kind of level, that it's, it's almost like an adversarial trial. This is very unfortunate. And there are, seems to be things which are clear and, and, and unarguable, which are being argued like the, the decision of a constitutional court with anybody, which anybody can and find online and read. These things should not happen. One has to consider this is a human rights process. And one has to consider the feelings and the dignity of the parents and the children involved. And of course, this, that the state is not being abused in any way or are, are, are their obligations uh, um, doubled in any way. But please, this is the sort of thing that we need quiet minds to sit and consider what ought to be done. And But I thank the, the, the uh, representatives of the petitioners, the um, delegation from the state, and I thank the interpreters, and I thank all of you for being here, and those who are online who have listened to this matter. I now ask for, for, for you to stay in line for the photograph to be taken, and then we can all wave goodbye. Thank you so much, Commissioner. I'm going to take the photo now, if everybody can look at the camera. Thank you. Just going to be just a second. Eric or Tiago or Tiago? This is Tiago. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all of you. You have 30 days to submit your Gracias. additional statements in writing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.